is the battlefield of eastern Ukraine in pretty much complete chaos. Who controls what? We are still trying to figure it out and figure out what the next moves are going to be, not just for Russia, who realizes they have to settle in for a long fight, but for Ukraine, who now has a chance to take back the offense. I'm Paul, U.S. Army combat veteran. It is January 16th, 2022. This is your daily Ukraine update. Let's get into it. Okay, first, when we look at the control map, you guys can see this, as always, is about 24 hours behind, but you can see that there's been some Russian advances reported uh, on the western part of Solodar as they move towards Blahodatne. You also have Russian advances uh, near the last of this wood line near Bakhmut, uh, and they've moved into urban territory here and also have made some minor advances um, in the uh, southeastern part of the city, right? Moving down, what's also interesting is that Russia has also made some advances near Optine and Vodiane. Uh, you guys can see these are small villages uh, that sort of surround Avdivka, and but in terms of compromising a larger tactical situation, uh, it's not really the case these guys are making fairly minor gains and you guys can see that beyond these two villages there's literally nothing here until you get to avdivka almost a kilometer and a half away but the biggest danger is probably that avdivka would be cut off but as you guys can see the roadways to and from avdivka have considerable uh have a considerable buffer between them and the front lines so what you end up with it'll be harder to encircle avdivka uh if that is indeed russia's objective which it may be uh, but it's just not clear now when we move over to the combat map you guys can see that this is reporting a little bit different this also has of course russian forces advancing beyond the rail line and pressuring blahodatne uh it's got them pushing towards also this northern village of sil when we look to the south you can see this does not yet have them uh, holding the entirety of the forest in the northeast uh, and does not have them taking these couple of urban blocks here. It also doesn't even have Russia occupying these city blocks uh, on the eastern side of Bakhmut. And it also has the level of control in Optine as being a little bit regressed relative to the control map. And of course, when we go all the way down, let's see if we can find old Donetsk city. Uh, here we go. You can see that this shows that uh, Vodiane and Optine are not yet under uh, Russian control. So it, all this means is that things are quite contested right now. Uh, no surprises there. Of course, when we look at War Mapper, uh, War Mapper has even more different perspectives. Uh, no changes. Uh, they're reporting no changes in the last 24 hours. Uh, even no changes in the last 24 hours in the area or the the area around Bakhmut. Though this has them pressuring Seal, it has them near Blahodatne, uh, and it but it does not have them fully controlling the forest in the northeast. Oh, but interestingly, they have added that they control one city block. You can see here on the. Uh, in this block in the east of Bakhmut, just one in the very, very south. So, I mean, to be clear, the idea, and, and let's keep our perspective here, the idea that we can in virtually real time see down to the tens of meters uh, the control that different sides have in a fast-breaking conflict like this is unprecedented. Uh, when I was in Afghanistan, obviously there weren't uh, lines of contact like this, um, but being able to see real-time pictures of friendly forces and how they're arrayed and where they're located was a exceptional, exceptionally rare uh, uh, feature that was using the best 
and at the time secret military technology i mean it's not secret it's a blue force tracker but you know the satellites and stuff were considered secret um but the idea that we got that picture and now we can go on to uh, twitter.com and a couple of other websites and see real time the evolving situation on the ground uh, is still incredible by almost any war's standards. So now we've got to ask ourselves, what is Russia going to do? Well, I still maintain that their major offensive efforts probably are petering out of steam. I think these maps may be catching up to the reality uh, as Russia consolidates its gains and the mapping uh, the mapping programmers uh, officially draw the lines and say, yes, we are Russia is not getting pushed out, for example, of Western Solidar. Uh, we are going to mark this as as Russia controlled. But uh what i think is interesting i still think so it's fair to say that russia's offensive has sort of exhausted itself or 90 i'll say 90 to 95 percent exhausted itself russia needs to reevaluate you may have noticed in the news that the kremlin changed out their overall theater commander that's usually a sign that that progress is insufficiently uh forward looking and you notice that that change was basically concurrent with this major, major push near Solidar and Bakhmut. And so I sort of suspect that this is the new commander's way of showing meaningful progress, even though the preceding commander uh, advocated more caution. But the Kremlin is starting to realize that not only do they need fresh leadership, but they need some fresh strategic changes on the 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 backfield so to speak in order to sustain this conflict and the number one is of course near and long-term force generation efforts they are going to try to get to 2 million per military personnel up from 1.5 million uh, as of september of this year and russian military command assumes this is going to be a second wave of mobilization there may be uh, expanded eligibility for conscription, mobilization, etc. Uh, though there are significant logistical issues, of course, and the there the Russian military is going to have to solve those training and logistics issues, unlike what they've been doing since the fall, which is rushing untrained soldiers to the front. And again, if you've been on the Patreon, you know that this Friday, one of the viral videos we looked at was helmet cam footage from a Russian uh, unit engaging in an attack where you saw large numbers of the unit simply uh, when they took fire simply fall to the ground and lay there paralyzed i'm going to say it was i mean 65 70 percent of the unit uh appeared too panicked or too untrained to even return fire um and you could see that only a few of the soldiers were even sh shooting back at the enemy at all this is the sort of of uh low level of training and the sort of unfortunate reality that happens when you have this poor level of training you have soldiers who not only are unable to contribute to the combat fight but as we saw in this video some of them appeared to become wounded therefore requiring the experienced capable soldiers who weren't frozen in panic to stop firing and begin to withdraw them from the front so i think even russian commanders on the ground understand that these mobilized personnel need to be trained and equipped so we should expect to uh we should expect to see the Russian mobilization not produce uh, troops on the battlefield for some months after the initial wave. Uh, of course, Russia also needs to equip those troops and it needs to figure out how it's going to supply itself with things like reconnaissance drones, uh, potentially weapons, ammunition uh and even just maintain what it has let alone uh try to equip its soldiers with things like body armor uh and of course they need to also take control of the information space which has also been comparably embarrassing for russia it's been dominated by well people like me uh mill bloggers uh civilians often veterans uh who 
use in Russia, they use Telegram to reach an audience where they provide accurate, what they feel is a more accurate and less biased perspective of the conflict uh, relative to what they're getting from Russian controlled major media sources. And the problem is the Kremlin was happy to have them when they were, well, pro-Kremlin, but when they started to criticize the Russian Ministry of Defense, these uh, information mill bloggers suddenly became a thorn in Russia's side. And now Russia has to solve the problem of not removing people from their only source of information, uh, which would infuriate the public and leave them feeling even more blind. But they also can't have these rogue uh, mill bloggers putting out information that uh, Russia and the Kremlin feels is not appropriate for public consumption. So Russia's got a lot of backfield work to do before it can really meaningfully launch an offensive. And you know, we look at these these uh, you know tens of meters of territory, but you guys can see in the grand scheme of things, uh, in this entire conflict, you look at areas where Ukraine has recently uh, achieved battlefield successes in Kharkiv and in Kherson, and you guys can see that even as we work back through the map, there's so very little. The level of territory seized is just absolutely infinitesimal. Um, you, you, when we zoom out just to the entirety of the front, we can't even really see the difference between Russia attempting to seize Bakhmut. Right, the, all of its all of its tremendous advances have amounted to very little meaningful change to the operational environment. Right, so Russia really isn't. Uh, currently equipped to do anything resembling winning this conflict, even if it only aspires to liberate uh, Luhansk and Donetsk. Now, what can Ukraine do? Well, I think I maintain that Ukraine would be crazy to uh, launch an offensive before it's received at least the lion's share of the promised armored uh, and tracked and mechanized vehicles that its allies have agreed to provide it. It's going to be receiving a significant number of Bradley fighting vehicles. These are uh, like the best thought of as BMPs on steroids, armored, well equipped troop transports that have been had uh, are equipped, I believe, with a auto cannon and obviously. <laughs> They didn't let, I was not mech infantry, so I don't know anything about Bradley's. But they are really, really effective fighting forces. They're combat proven. Um, and they are, can potentially, because they're tracked, are going to be able to really improve the mobility of Ukrainian troops on the offensive. They're a great uh, support by fire platform and pretty tough and resilient. They also are going to be getting some main battle tanks from, uh, I believe, uh, the UK and uh, other NATO allies, I think Poland. And there's some rumors that even Germany is going to try to get them some of their uh, generation behind main battle tanks. So all of that could make a tremendous difference given that Russia really has lost a lot of its most modern main battle tanks. So being able to get into the fight, uh, Ukraine is going to have to wait for those crews to get trained up, for the logistic systems to get into place. But then once they do, then they'll be able to position themselves to hopefully launch a decisive attack that can break Russian lines. Now, where will it be? That's one of the biggest questions. Some people think they're going to try to push towards Mariupol and split Russian forces in two. I maintain that this would not be a great way to do things because you don't want to create an unsustainable salient. Uh, Obviously, a river crossing is probably out. That's logistically very difficult. Uh, so I actually think that the two most likely, you also, of course, don't want to put yourself in a situation where, again, you're in an unprotected bubble. That's probably why the Kharkiv offensive was, was chosen as a location, because as you guys can see, once they cut through it, cut, like punched in and moved up, 
and down, you can see there was a natural area in which they could isolate the Russians and prevent them from launching a counterattack. So where would it go from here? Well, I actually think the, this northern part may still be a promising location from which to launch attacks. Um, it's the easiest salient. I think it's also possible, but not super likely that you could maybe make some sort of effort to try to drive the Russians out from this, uh, from the western or the eastern bank of the Dnipro. Uh, this would be tough because you'd have to literally cut in like to Melitopol and then cut it off. That's not preposterous but remember there's rumors that some of russia's best units are dug in around Kherson. so again if i were a betting man i would suspect that ukraine's plan would probably be to shave off another piece of territory here maybe move uh push again along this crimina line but yeah i i think that's honestly one of the best options they could possibly try to break through Lusychansk and run for the Russian border, cutting off this entire portion of Russian forces here. Uh, again, not it would still be tough simply because remember, Russia can just leave, evac move its forces out from here and reposition them in the north. So cutting Russian forces off is, is harder to do. Um, so yeah, there's not a great and obvious location where the next major offensive would go. But if I were a betting man, I would bet it's going to be somewhere in this region. Anyway, guys, that's all I had for you. Of course, if you want access to the Patreon videos, um, all I look at all of the week's viral combat videos, the kind that YouTube won't let me show you. I break them all down. It drops uh, every Friday. Thanks to my lieutenant tier patrons. The link is in the description if you want to join the community. And I'll see you guys in the next one.